Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Infinite Playa K Dome, uh, Microdome. My name is Sunny Strasberg, and I am a therapist in Salt Lake City. I'm so excited for this panel. This is the Women of Ketamine panel. Um, <clears throat> I am a Jungian archetypal psychotherapist. I uh, am certified in EMDR and psychedelic assisted therapy, and I offer ketamine assisted therapy in my practice. I've started a nonprofit organization with Phil Wolfson called the Indra's Net Coalition. And I am so excited to be with this group of incredible powerhouse women. These women are the leaders of the field and we are going to be discussing all things ketamine tonight. I'm gonna to turn over the uh, introductions to each of you. So just whoever wants to go first, uh, hop in. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here with all these incredible women. I'm Gita Vaid. I'm a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst practicing ketamine assisted psychotherapy in New York City. I'm on faculty of the Ketamine Training Center and co-founder of the Center for Natural Intelligence. Welcome. Hi, I'm Julaine Andrews and I am a, married, a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I uh, do quite a few things, uh, but most importantly, I work at the Center for Transformational Psychotherapy and uh, provide ketamine-assisted psychotherapy there. I also am, um, work on the phase three MDMA trial uh, in San Francisco, providing MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for, or PTSD. I'm um, also uh, on the a trainer um, on the, with the Academy Training Center, and uh, have we have provided training across the country. And uh, Gita and many of the people here have been with us uh, in that endeavor. So thank you very much for having me, Sunny. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Jennifer Dorr. I'm a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, and former general surgeon. And I practice ketamine-assisted psychotherapy and uh, general psychiatry and psychodynamic therapy um, at my practice in Woodside, California, which is in the Bay Area. It's called Helios Wellness. Um, and I've been doing that for about six years and have been working on um, ketamine assisted psychotherapy and developmental trauma, which is my main interest um, and working on a new research study um, in that field. Hello, I'm Marcela Talora and I'm the principal investigator for phase three study MDMA assisted psychotherapy in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and I also, I'm also a trainer for, um, for MDMA assisted psychotherapy and a supervisor. And in my private practice, I do ketamine assisted therapy. And I've been doing that for about three years, working exclusively with uh, depression and trauma. Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Whippo. I'm really happy to be here. I'm also a licensed psychotherapist in California in the Bay Area. I work at the Center for Transformational Psychotherapy with Tulane, seeing patients for ketamine assisted psychotherapy. I'm also one of the um, co-authors of the soon-to-be written and published lactation study studying the psychopharmacology of ketamine on lactation so that we can uh, develop a protocol for treating postpartum depression with ketamine. I've worked in women's health for a little over a decade, um, so it's a passion of mine to be in this circle of women and support women. Um, most of my work has been with mothers, so I'm excited to bring psychedelics into the postpartum space. And I'm also a certified yoga instructor and meditation instructor. So happy to be here. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Monica Windsor, and um, I am, along with Gita Vade, a co-founder of the Center for Natural Intelligence in New York City. I practice ketamine-assisted psychotherapy there. And I'm also on the faculty of the Ketamine Training Center. And I am the chair of the board of the Ketamine Research Foundation as well. My background is in uh, yoga and yoga therapy and meditation as well. And um, 
we at our Art Center bring uh, holotropic practices together um, for these transformative processes. Happy to be here. Hi everybody, my name is Lauren Taus and I am a psychotherapist based in Venice Beach, California. I work with ketamine assisted psychotherapy and I'm also trained in the MAPS MDMA protocol. My foundation is also with yoga. I've been a teacher for over two decades and the importance of the body is something that, that I continue to come back to and being in a deeper space of listening while we open up our consciousness with ketamine assisted psychotherapy specifically in, in my uh, home practice. I also have a podcast called Inbodied Life, which features conversations around psychedelics, mental health, and general good living. It's a lot of fun. And I have panelists here who've been on it. So really grateful to be here with these powerful women. Hi, everyone. My name is Veronica Gold, and I'm as well delighted to be on this panel with friends and colleagues. Uh, I am a psychotherapist from San Francisco, California. I am one of the therapists on the MDMA clinical trials for the treatment of PTSD with Tulane. And I'm as well an uh, associate supervisor for the MEPS study. I have a private practice where I provide mostly therapy, EMDR, somatic experiencing. And I'm a co-founder of Polaris Insight Center, a clinic in San Francisco providing ketamine-assisted psychotherapy training and consultation. And, and uh, we've been providing ketamine-assisted therapy for about three years. And I'm excited to share with all of you about our experiences. What a spectacular group of humans here, right? <laughs> I'm just feeling the immensity of the experience that's in this little container here. Um, well, since this is the Women of Ketamine panel, I think the first question that we want to explore is being female in this male-dominated field. Let's talk about that, what's important about talking about women in the psychedelic medicine field. Who wants to go first and tackle this one? I can start and uh, I'll just say a little bit um, and I hope everybody jumps in. Um, because I started doing this uh, about six years ago, um, it's, it was hard. Uh, it was hard um, working with something I really wanted to do and also uh, working with some, you know, some wonderful men, but uh, powerful and uh, men that had been in the field a long time and trying to find my way and find my, especially find my voice. Um, it was, uh, I, you know, that was, until Sunny broached this question on our topics, I hadn't really thought about it. Um, and and it, uh, it has been hard. And I think, you know, one thing, and I want to just uh, to share gratitude right now for our Marcella, uh, Annie Midhoffer, they were my first two female models in, in this work. And to see them, um, you know, especially Annie working alongside Michael Midhopper and uh, watching the grace um, and um, support that he provided her and the way he would bring her in, even though he was a psychiatrist and, you know, and can certainly be, you know, a, he was well seasoned um, in this field. And, but how respectful he was to his partner, Annie, and then Marcella and her husband, Bruce. Uh, we're such a beautiful team, and I, I could see that working in a team was possible, um, but also realize that, um, you know, with sometimes it's top down with uh, the, there may be the, the doctor, the male owns the clinic, um, is the more prominent person, and to be able to not be pushy, but yet still find a voice and have your presence matter. Um, and find your own way to make that happen uh, was really important and it took me a long time and i think some of what i learned actually came from other females that would um, and some of them are here like gita and monica would um, talk we would all talk and about what we each would bring to the work in our in our feminine way and not that we couldn't also be in charge um, but that we could also bring our, our own grace, our nurturing, our feminine presence. 
and that that was just as important as being able to, um, you know, to to talk uh, at length um, as, as and to hold court as some of the men did. So I'm hoping I'm not offending anybody here, but uh, my journey was pretty difficult. Um, and at the same time, I was so full of gratitude to be able to do the work, so. Um, I, I just like to say that, you know, while I do feel it's, it's challenging and I, and, I, and I acknowledge that to Julaine, um, to be a minority in a field, I also feel like um, we have an incredibly exciting opportunity with the nature of psychedelic assisted therapy or with ketamine um, to really create systems change and, um, and to really mindfully um, do so. And I think, you know, panels like this, communicating like this with, um, with, um, with peers, with leaders in the field, um, with new um, and aspiring um, female therapists is critical at this time. And um, to be able to really operationalize. And I think, you know, men and women have the opportunity um, with um, ketamine assisted psychotherapy to really operationalize feminine values. And it's, you know, it is in essence, a, a lot of what we all do in um, this form of therapy. So it's, I think an opportunity to articulate that and to model that as women and foster that in men as well. Yeah, and to kind of follow up on Julaine, what you were saying, because for me as well, kind of seeing Marcella and Annie and you as well, we're really role models of uh, women in the psychedelic field. And it has been really beautiful to bring these uh, feminine principles, which I think is really, it's that it's not enough to be a woman, because I think in this society, to be successful woman was to embody the male principles of competitiveness and certain way of presenting and showing up. And so how can we stay in, in the feminine of, you know, inclusivity and nurturing and humility and caring and bring it into the work and field. And um, it's wonderful to see more and more women, uh, you know, having leading positions and, and having this impact. And so I, personally experience both that, you know, sometimes there are challenges when I'm with my male colleagues and maybe we're sharing the same thing and people standing in front of us are looking at the male colleague and like almost if I wasn't there, even though we are both saying the same, you know, talking about the same thing. And on the other side, having a big community of women of working together and sharing uh, and supporting each other on this path. And really envisioning a new way of being of this mutual support and collaboration rather than competition is that how all of our success can help more people. So I think there is this beautiful possibility in that. Yeah, I'd like to um, also add um, a few words about how excited I am to be part of this panel with all these incredible women because I feel like it's so important, not only because well, women, but this whole imbalance I sense in the field, perhaps in society too, between um, masculine versus feminine principles, not that um, any gender has to carry one, but I do think, you know, even the dosing prescriptions, the high dose, the ego dissolution, the uh, faster approach versus a more feminine um, process oriented approach where the relationship is valued, where nurturing, where intuition and um, evolving and a kind of growth experience um, is invited. I think they're very different models and I think that um, feminine energy and principles really need to be heard. So it's exciting to be part of introducing that um, into our work, but also into the whole conversation. Um, I wanted to kind of approach it a little from a, a different angle in terms of how sometimes, uh, often actually, it happens that when women are included, it's a little bit like, almost like, um, because we want it, because we want to have some diversity or like almost like a favor <laughs> to include the, the feminine voice. And um, recently I was asked about like, why women, you know, why women in psychedelics? Why is that important? And I'm like, wow, like what a question to ask. And to me, it's like, 
you're missing half the picture if you don't include women. It's like, would you buy a half a painting? No, you would never do that. Like, it, it's you would be actually missing half. And so, is that what we want? And I'd like um, to be able to to get to a place where that's not even a question. You know, that we we don't we're not coming in with this question of why women in psychedelics. So. Um, that's my goal, to, to erase that question from, um, mostly from the males interviewing <laughs> and, and um, asking me to participate from that standpoint. That's so interesting, Marcella, because I feel like it's kind of the opposite, like why men? I mean, I know, I know why men, because like the sort of historical, historically, but in terms of the work that we do and you know, and you say it's half and I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say it's half, but a lot of the nurturing and the, the sort of receptive state, particularly that I think that ketamine kind of puts us in by quieting the logical linear sort of almost masculine part of the brain and allowing for, you know, flow that is, I think, inherently feminine. It's, it, it almost feels like, um, by excluding women, it's like excluding women from the practice of gynecology. I mean, it seems inherent, the feminine energy seems inherent in psychedelics and particularly in ketamine because of at least the way I see it in terms of how, you know, guiding people to be more receptive and to receive and connect to their intuition and the opportunity that ketamine gives them. So I think it would be, whether a woman is embodying that energy or not, it really would be, I think, you know, uh, denying the very essence of the thing that we're doing by not including women. I mean, in, in, in therapy and mothering and a lot of the wounds that, that are there are wounds of that mother energy, whether that's from a mother in a female body or not having that energy in, in general. So I think, yeah, it, it, it's almost like a bizarre question. <laughs> I think we were here from the beginning and it, it feels like we were kind of um, maybe we became too powerful and they like snuffed us out and all of our history. And then we're just sort of like kind of reclaiming, you know, uh, our place, but it, it seems very natural to me. I even also think, and I wanted to make sure to bring this up. Um, and it reminded me what you said, Julian was, you know, I, I think the thing that I noticed when I started to listen and learn about ketamine, because that was the first psychedelic assisted psychotherapy that I learned about um, was learning about the, the, the history the, the you know, how it came to be like, who was it that was doing this work and how did they figure out the best way to do it? And, you know, thinking like, Oh, well, there was a lot of men who were sitting around doing it, which is great. I mean, I, and, and wonderful. And I feel like I have, you know, a lot of masculine energy so I can relate to that, but the way in which they decided to do it, you know, may have had something to do with, their own masculine energy. I'm not saying it did, but but what I what I was uh, what I was kind of thinking about as I was doing some of the trainings we did together, Julian, and seeing women in the group and how they would respond to the sort of the method that we were teaching them. You know, laying still with the eye shades, and you know, I, I I witnessed a lot of the women in the group. You know, just inherently moving around and being more somatic, and 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 it really dawned on me like wow you know giving people permission and you know it doesn't have to be a male or female thing but i noticed that that a lot of the women you know tended to want to move around and giving them permission to do that right as long as you know we were in a group as, as long as they weren't disrupting the group but that there may be different ways of doing this and there may have something to do with like the way in which we develop the method that we the methods for what we do for anything may have something to do with the people who develop them and and having a having a so I think, I, I really think that had something to do, it was a real aha moment for me with the way that maybe we teach how to do it. And you always have to have a starting place, right? But having, a, having that in your head that, you know, um, there might be different ways of doing it and different ways of getting it to work. And even in my own ketamine experiences, you know, seeing how different things, you know, moving around and, 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 you know, even d interpreting different kinds of experiences, whereas the canon may have been very visual that, you know, you know, some of the more feminine experiences or even some of my own were much more somatic, they were much more energetic and, and really being able to give validity to that, especially when kind of helping 
you know, clients who may not have like a predominantly visual or um, experience, which I'm not saying it's associated directly with men, but I think I, I see it a lot in men, more, more of the visual versus sort of the energetic or the, there was a different, you know, something interesting about females in the field. Yeah, I wanted to mention Marcia Moore, who was one of the early uh, therapists and researchers w using ketamine. And she has a beautiful book, Journeys into the Bright World. And I love her text. And, um, you know, maybe it's unknown to a lot of people, but it, that's one of the women I'd like to acknowledge from early on, who's done and described beautiful work with ketamine. Um, it's it's great to hear that not only you know bringing in the feminine voice in, as leaders in the ketamine field, but I'm really hearing a lot of you comment on the the bringing the feminine into the protocols into the medicine with the somatic experience or what Gita you talked about. I really appreciate that, like approaching the psychedelic space instead of like going gonzo with the high dose. Really, like you know, what does it feel like to to ease into it in a more feminine receptive space? so beautiful and interesting, a whole different way of conceptualizing psychedelic medicine from the feminine perspective. Does anyone else have anything to, else to, to put in about women in ketamine being female? I just wanna share that I have felt abundantly supported by the men in the space that are in my path. And I have felt very uplifted and mentored and connected and I personally, you know, I'm, I'm aware that I'm a woman and I'm aware that, uh, you know, even for example, in my, my private practice as, a, as the therapist is, is not led by the MD and that there's sometimes like, you know, someone wants to talk to the doctor, but as a woman, I, I just want to share that my experience has been very positive with, with the men in the space and I'm grateful for that. I, I, I want to say something just a little, maybe a little controversial, but at one time in this space of being grateful of being a woman is that, and, a, and part of the privilege, I think, of being a woman is also being able to do, we, do, we don't do as much of dyadic work at my practice, but we do a lot of the individual academy assisted psychotherapy. And when I've had men work in our practice, we've, we've had to be a little bit more careful about videotaping or doing things or kind of protecting, you know, the patient and the therapist. And I feel like, and, you know, we always, we're all, all, you know, have to do that. But in being a woman, I've been able to do some individual work and maybe not worry as much. And I just feel like that may sound silly to all of you. And I, I know men and women both have to, but just the way our culture is usually the opposite where, um, you know, women have to do the extra work, but really it's, has made it easy to do a lot of individual work and not have as much worry about it. And so I just, I feel like that's a little bonus and I don't usually get that. <laughs> um, anyway. Melissa, did you want to say something? Yeah. The, the last thing I guess that I can add is that, you know, one of the, the, I guess, textbook uh, ketamine experiences that people can have is revisiting their birth. Um, and to be held in that space of revisiting our birth, which actually happened to me during the training, which was my first ketamine experience. And then when I read about it in the ketamine papers, you know, it kind of blew my mind. Um, but to be held in that space by a female practitioner, and I want to also invite, you know, female identifying practitioner, because I think it's a really important space to be inclusive um, of people who are transgender, of people who you know, are non-binary, that the feminine can be embodied in lots of different ways. But I, this medicine, I agree with you, Jennifer, does have so many feminine properties. Um, and it's been compared to ayahuasca, which is, you know, the, the grandmother medicine. So I do feel that the feminine is inherent. And I also understand that throughout history of psychedelic psychotherapy, so many men have been forefront. And also like what Jennifer was saying, throughout history, you know, in over centuries, the women were at the center of goddess culture and putting healing forth. So this is that this does feel like a time of reclaiming and also of, of uh, revolution of moving forward. And uh, yeah, this is such a wonderful group to contribute to that conversation and hopefully the ongoing change. I definitely want to give a shout out that there have been women in psychedelic medicine 
for centuries, <laughs> right? And that it's not like it's been all men and then women just recently showed up, you know, in the last 10 years. I mean, it's, it, it has been a very feminine oriented medicine for a long, long time. Um, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about ketamine. Why you work with ketamine, what, what you like about it, why ketamine over other psychedelics. So let's explore that topic, why ketamine? I can uh, take a stab at that. Um, you know, I'm um, lucky enough to uh, work, uh, have worked quite a bit with um, uh, above ground in a legal way with MDMA and uh, with ketamine. And people often, Cindy will ask that question, and my clients will often ask that question even if they ever come in uh, because there is a maybe more, uh, I call it a sexiness around some of the the medicines, um, uh, psilocybin, um, ayahuasca, um, LSD, and um, uh, MDMA, and you know, ketamine isn't uh, hasn't been on the stage as long, and you know, I, at sometimes I thought, well, maybe uh, it seems like uh, at first it was like a like a stepsister in a way, um, and it wasn't as sexy, and maybe because it's, it's legal. And so, uh, so I think two things, one, it wasn't as well known. It hadn't been around as long in, in uh, you know, general use and um, it was legal. So therefore the mis there wasn't the mystique. Um, but putting that aside, uh, if I could work with all the medicines, um, I'm not as experienced uh, with some of them, but, um, say for example if because mdma will be legal and i think psilocybin will be too to follow um, and there's ketamine i would um, always still work with ketamine i find it um, really a beautiful medicine it's a gentle medicine even though the experiences can be incredibly powerful it's a medicine that you can use um, multiple times a week where where some of the others like mdma um, it's best to use those like once a month. Um, and, and the healing that comes from all of them is powerful and, and real. But um, for people who come to us with um, severe depression, which you know, we work a lot with, PTSD and especially anxiety, I would use ketamine often first for depression and anxiety because it, uh, to help a, a remission of those symptoms to have depression, uh, have uh, melt away a bit, have people lighten up, to have the anxiety calm down, um, and people get a sense of who they are without those symptoms. And then uh, sometimes that's all that is really needed, but at times people uh, could really benefit from some of the other medicines. And, and I would love to have them all in my toolbox to be able to use um, when needed. I'd like to admit a conversion story. I started my you know, psychedelic adventures as, as a human being before I even considered or even knew that it was possible to intertwine these tools within my psychotherapy practice. And I completed my MDMA training before my ketamine training. And when my dear friend, Natalie Ginsberg, who's the director of advocacy and policy at MAPS told me to go complete a, a ketamine training, I, I was shocked because I had only seen it abused in recreational contexts. And in my mind, to the dissociative qualities of ketamine in, in group spaces felt very alarming to me. And admittedly, I didn't understand what, it, what this tool was. I just saw people kind of chasing these, these um, like it, it, leaving, leaving, like deeply, deep, deep departures. And uh, in my training, which I was um, taught by, by Phil, Julaine, and Gita, so really excited to be on a panel with two of my teachers, I was able to have my own experiences in a container that was specific and designed for an educational purpose, but as well with the welcoming of, of my person and of each of the participants in, in the course. And so over the, the, over the duration of the training, I witnessed so many different integration experiences and understood immediately that I, 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 had, I had no idea what I was talking about before and how potent a tool ketamine is. And 
what I love about ketamine in my own personal practice is a that it's you know I think it's great that it's short lasting so I can offer more to a greater number of people within my practice there's very little that's contraindicated in terms of people taking other psychotropic medications so there are more beings that can avail themselves of this treatment and as Julaine said there's so many conditions where this would still be my first go-to even if everything was legal and i am so grateful to to work with this medicine i love this medicine and you know one of the ways in which i look at it because i mean any number of uh, scenarios can present in in a in given journey but the the dissociative qualities for me allow a person this disruption of ordinary mind this sense of leaving a little bit which in the way i understand it allows for a gentler return and a way in which engaging with with this this being happens with more softness and more kindness and you know my ethos is that all all progress is return and and we're just come it's a homecoming in a good way and so I, I, I love that I had a conversion story because uh, I think there's a lot of misconceptions around this particular medicine. And there certainly continues to be lots of different applications, many of which in my mind are not therapeutic. Um, and I'm, I, I love, I love, love, love working with it with my clients. So many of the things that I like about it have already been said by all of you. Um, so I'm trying to think of the things that may be unique and to not repeat. One of the things, although, maybe you guys spoke to a little bit is I kind of feel like the way that I, that I put it is that, that ketamine, it has its signature like all of the other psychedelics, but it really doesn't have its own ego. And so I feel like whatever comes up is really what's exactly kind of leisurely focused, relevant for the person. And it really works with the person. And so like you could get someone, who really experiences loving kindness, someone else who is experiencing detachment. It's, it's so varied and so specific to the individual that it just, I just really love that aspect of, of, of the medicine and um, where you don't see the medicine as much in it, but you really just see the person or the person's psyche or the person's heart or whatever, the uh, body mind connection. And so um, when people say, well, is this, you know, people who are sort of naive to these medicines or medicine in general say, well, am I just getting high? And I said, well, not everybody feels exactly this way. You know, this is totally new and unique to you. And I know you could say that about all the other psychedelics, but I just really think there's something about ketamine that, you know, really works with the individual. And I just, I just love that over and over again. And it actually really keeps me um, engaged because every, you know, almost at, even though there are themes and different things that almost every experience is unique. Uh, if I can add to, I feel like one of the reasons why I like ketamine is that it has the potential to be so visionary, which, you know, so many of the psychedelic medicines can be visionary, but the ketamine journey is short. So I find that um, dream work is such a helpful tool in the visionary space with ketamine, whereas, you know, with other psychedelics, it might be, um, it might be different, you know, a, a bigger experience. Um, and I don't, I don't mean that in a judgmental way, bigger is not always better. Um, but I love that, uh, I love that dream work is, is such a, um, I think parallel process with the ketamine work. And I love doing that as a psychotherapist. And um, yeah, and also I love that it's legal. It feels very safe. And for people who might be, I mean, you would be surprised here in the Bay Area when we did our lactation study with ketamine, um, Julaine and I and Phil Wolfson and Rob Cole, it was really hard actually to get volunteers that women in the postpartum space um, were mystified by the possibility that ketamine could be a safe medicine to use while breastfeeding um, because of the association that, that people have with it being you know a party drug but what is exciting about this time is that we do get to rewrite the narrative um, of this of this medicine that is has the potential to be so accessible for so many people Yeah, and there's that range, Melissa, right? Whereas like sometimes it's dose dependent where you can get the psychological, but then you can also get the mystical. And again, usually dose dependent, but like 
so versatile. <laughs> yeah, I as well love ketamine and love working with this medicine and I, you know, really could repeat everything what you uh, already said, but that there is this gentleness as, as, as Julaine was saying, but as well, I see ketamine as a very advanced psychedelic. So with the higher doses that it can really bring very deep transpersonal states and transformation in entering this non-ordinary state of consciousness where people can experience the ego dissolution transformational experience. Um, and that we can really provide this individualized care. And, you know, I've over and over again been surprised with the possibilities and how the healing can unfold with the medicine. I, as well, one other thing I was thinking about is kind of about the, um, that there is something unique about ketamine being quite a new medicine, that it's really been less than 100 years that's been discovered. Um, and that each medicine has something kind of like this morphogenic field that it brings, that it's almost like the experience of ingesting the medicine take, brings as well all the experience of, spe of people who have taken this medicine before. And so that's when people take psilocybin or they take ayahuasca that oftentimes they can describe kind of similar experiences. And that with ketamine, there are these kind of signature experiences, but as well, I feel it's like the morphogenic field of the medicine is still being created. And so the, the really the, um, it's so different how it, what it brings through for different people. So it's a, it's for, for me, that part is very exciting of being able to work with this medicine. And um, of course it is legal and it's something that when we get trained with MDMA and we're working on the study, um, we wanted to be able to work with more people with combining non-ordinary states of consciousness and psychotherapy. And so kind of uh, seeing what Julaine and Phil and Jen were doing, it was a, um, really get of a, a starting point for us to start working with ketamine. Yeah, I wanted to add a few words as well. I, I'm a big fan of ketamine as everyone is here and there's certain features about it that I particularly appreciate. Um, I would say it's such an interesting medicine because it can really cultivate such a different experiences at different doses. So it can really be just a very anxiolytic kind of softening of defenses at low doses. And at high doses, you can have a completely visionary state emerge. So I really appreciate the fact that you can choreograph an experience and it's so easily titratable to the individual and so specific that it's very easy to really curate an experience for a person which is tailored to the individual. Um, I also love the fact it's such a, I think of all the medicines, the most meditative medicine. I think it really takes one out of their thinking mind to be able to connect with deep, deeper aspects of self. So you can really tap into the wisdom and the knowledge in the body with an awareness that feels very meditative, um, just as a signature. I'm sure they all do this, but I think that's a really prime property um, and unique to ketamine, which I really appreciate. And I think given that quality, if one can go to an ego dissolved state in the right relational field, I think it's particularly suitable, um, perhaps even the most suitable to deal with attachment wounds, which does get into some of the feminine qualities we talked about, uh, advantages of having a feminine um, energy or presence in the room while doing this facilitation work. Um, I also think it's just incredibly safe. I think it's already been mentioned in terms of psychotropics and um, side effects and not requiring a wash up for most medicines. So it's just a very versatile, I think, wonderful medicine. I can um, add just one little bit. I mean, I think all of you have said so many things that I agree with and that I believe and I, I like working with ketamine a lot. And I'm, you know, for me, MDMA kind of like is, my heart is in MDMA. And so um, ketamine was a little bit like, what? Um, so I think I, I was a little bit skeptic at the beginning and then really learned to really love working with it. And, um, you know, for all the reasons that you've said, but also one of the things I've noticed is, Ketamine is not judgmental. 
that it, there is a, there's a quality that it has where people, that judgment piece, self-judgment um, is not present. So it's not like, why did I, why did I think of that? Or why, you know, there is no criticism about um, whether it was good or bad, but, but, but really just falling into that experience of what I'm here to do and what is happening for me. So I haven't, uh, I appreciate that with the clients that I've worked with, that that piece that can come in, that judge is sort of steps back and allows for uh, the experience to take place. So it's one of the things I really love about it. Thank you. Spectacular, captivating answers. I love it. I'm just, I want to throw this out. This isn't on our, our topics, but I've heard people say that ketamine helps us work with death kind of in the way that ayahuasca does. And, and I've had a lot of clients see loved ones, have them visit loved, loved ones who have passed. And I'm curious if, if anybody wants to comment about that, because that seems like a very common theme that comes up more with ketamine than other psychedelics. Does anyone want to talk about that a little bit? Um, you know, um, I know I keep going first, but, uh, that's actually one of, it's, uh, that particular topic is so interesting to me. Um, you know, it, it brings us to the quality of the mystical and, you know, how careful, um, we have to be about not putting our own story or belief. And, you know, I have to say, I've learned so much uh, from doing so many thousands of sessions of ketamine, but I've. I know that there is something to some of uh, some of this, especially this um, these death experiences, and um, just because so many people have them, not everybody, but there's a commonality there. And you know, as to your about visiting loved ones who have died, you know, I have it that that happens as far as you know their faces come, um, their presence can sometimes be felt. But I think for me, what I noticed most in um, when I, it's what I call a near death experience. And I, when I coach clients as to uh, what they may experience, I do bring this up uh, so that they won't be frightened of it. Um, that often people will have an experience where they feel that they are dying or that they will, won't ever come back. Um, but more often it's a calm, beautiful experience where they sense that, um, they'll come back and say, I realized what death is about and what death is like. And I felt no fear. And at that time, I realized that, I think what they realize is that when that time comes for them or a loved one, that, um, that they have a sense of safety, comfort. And I think what I've heard um, over and over again is they'll say, I thought maybe I wouldn't come back and I was okay. And that's a very simple phrase, but for someone to feel that they're okay um, is, you know, that's why, you know, some of the work we're doing, uh, have done and will do in research with uh, using ketamine for uh, people with life-threatening illness and, uh, and at palliative care stage to help people have, even if we can give them that experience they can come back with a sense of calmness and acceptance and of letting go. The other thing people have experienced that I'm just always uh, just so uh, intrigued by is a sense of uh, merging. So it's a death experience, but they feel that they're merging with the universe or mer merging with a star or light or universal energy. Um, and so to me, that is actually one of the more beautiful things about doing ketamine work is when somebody can come back and share that story. Yeah, I can follow up on Julaine that I think there is a um, being, the dissociation provides the possibility of being consciousness without identification with one's body so that we are identified with our body and having the dissociative experience of existing but no longer being identified with body can be very healing and supportive and so we've worked with a lot of people uh who had who were close to to transitioning and um in that way the ketamine sessions were very helpful 
Um, and in, to your question, I as well worked with a lot of people who uh, were processing grief and they talked about experiences of connecting with the spirit of the person who has passed or passed on or that they were able to say goodbye in a way that they were not able to say goodbye in, in, in the real life because maybe of distance or being away from the person. Um, or having more insights and kind of a, a support almost from the person who passed in their grieving process. So um, I've definitely seen that being very, very powerful that people shared that they couldn't imagine they would have been able to deal with the grief in a way they've been able to with the help of this medicine. I'd like to add something to Veronica's comment because I, I completely concur with everything she said about these qualities of being pure consciousness, but also to um, emphasize perhaps the flip side of that. I think there's something so liberating when one can experience themselves as pure consciousness to actually re-enter into their experience and life and take possession of their own life then and write their own story after having an experience disconnected from all that we typically walk around being attached to in terms of our self and narrative constructions. And I think just the pure pleasure, I can't even tell you how many times I've experienced um, working with clients and myself, the joy of being an embodied being, which we take for granted, not having an other experience. So I think there's something really quite unique to have that experience to value the experience of what it is to be a spirit in a body. I think that's just as powerful in terms of living one's life and valuing one's life and taking possession of one's life. I, I wanted to say that I, in terms of the, the experience of dying or um, I see it as almost like a, a dissociating from the body just allows them to have a boundary that is further than the physical self. Mm -hmm. And that once that happens, it can feel like death. And what I've noticed is that it's also a way for them to then connect to generations in the past and to begin to heal generational trauma, that, that it is a doorway to be able to heal those wounds that happened. Uh, and, and, you know, I've seen it so much with females of just saying the wounds of my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother that 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 expansion and, and that feeling that it feels like death then opens opens that door for that connection to happen and for that healing to take place i think the only thing um i would also add um because there's been so much i think rich um so many rich insights um have been expressed but but just the the um, experience of energy as a kind of a pure energy, which is very common with ketamine um, when, in regards to death, you know, being, being um, having insight into what it feels like to have a pure energy, be pure energy, and then to come back into the body, as Gita said, and, and enjoy the sensuous nature of, you know, feeling your face or whatever, but knowing that the energy is always there um, can be very, I think, affirming and, um, you know, and also help people in their day-to-day -day consciousness of death. Yeah, I, I can just comment that on that and give a little bit more of a personal um, experience. I think that we can um, do that. Um, I'm comfortable doing that. In my first ketamine experience, um, I am ketamine experience becoming a point of consciousness and the liberation on coming back. It's just sort of echoing what everyone else was saying, but in not fearing death. And I remember saying, well, my, my consciousness is seaworthy because I was existed without a body. And, you know, if, 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 that direct experience was so important on so many levels, both spiritual and psychological and, you know, sort of, um, being a point of consciousness and kind of, I remember kind of saying to myself, well, I guess I'm here now and not remembering, I mean, obviously anything about being a human or there was nothing about anything except for just a point of dark consciousness and being okay with that. And then really being infused with sort of confi confidence in, in 
in that and in in something greater and how much that has sort of um how much that has offered my life on so many different ways and so um i think that that was just amazing and so i think our own personal experiences can also you know help us to see the power of the medicine so i definitely have experienced everything that you guys were just talking about personally it's really powerful beautiful thank you so much um lauren talked about it earlier about you know ketamine being a party drug and as i've been trained and trained in the psychedelic medicines what has come forward for me is how important the therapy is around the psychedelics, the set and setting, the music, the, the intention, the integration, that these medicines in my mind potentiate or amplify what we're working on, but, but it's all within this larger container that we're creating for our clients. Um, can we talk a little bit about the importance of therapy, set and setting, music, um, what that means to you, what your style of therapy is, and um, you know, just the importance of that with the ketamine experience. So when in my early years of being a licensed clinician, I was really frustrated with the lack of tools in my toolkit. And my experience of therapy was overly cognitive and hyper intellectual. I know that you can't think a feeling, a feeling must be felt energy and motion, emotion. And being able to invite these deep, deep, deep tools into the space of, of therapy is something that exponentially accelerates a process of a person getting back home to themselves. Because again, for me, all progress is return. And what I did always love about my work as a clinician was the value and potency of the therapeutic alliance and the therapeutic relationship. And the way in which I work is with the understanding that the relationship is as important, if not more important than the medicine in the successful outcome of my clients. So I do not work with medicine if I don't have a very clear relationship established. That can be done pretty quickly when I believe that medicine is appropriate. That being said, like I need to know who's who in my client zoo. I need to know where they're going and growing so that I can support them in unpacking the experience. I believe that that very like tender and, and fertile liminal space that presents in the immediate aftermath of a journey merits real attention. And in my practice, like I, I really want to be with them. And I want my clients to, to know that not only is the medicine safe, but that, that I'm safe. And, and that takes a bit of time to establish a rapport. And, and you know, I mean, I, I had a, a client once tell me that she saw a clinician for four years she didn't like. And I, I looked her in the eyes and I said, you have full permission not to like me and you can fire me whenever you want. Like, you know, this is, this is a, a, a business of relationship. This is a business of connection. And I say that my business is the isness. And so when I'm working with people, it's very much within a relational context. Like that's incredibly, incredibly, like incredibly important to me. And when I'm bringing medicine in, yes, there's a playlist. I have so much fun creating them. Um, sometimes I'll like straight up DJ for somebody because I, I like kind of like feel them and can shift, but I of course have my playlist. And I always prepare my clients uh, prior to and after sessions with um, journaling assignments that they share with me, which have been so fun uh, in so many cases, like people who may have a harder time verbalizing their experience can write prolifically. And, and then with the integration, I'm always encouraging people to be creative. Again, I'll provide them with journal prompts, but I've got so much art in my home that clients have made based on their journey experiences. I, I know that clients of mine are like dancing to R&B in their living rooms. Like, you know, the, the people are, are using mind, body, spirit as tools to integrate the, the, the profundity of the experience into the profundity of a life change. So I want to be intimate witness to that and part of that process and not just blast someone to outer space. I want to 
say I totally agree with all the things that you've just said, Lauren. I, I, I love being on this panel because I feel like <laughs> you don't have to say it all because everybody is saying a little piece of it. One piece that I think is important, um, especially as I bring new clinicians into my practice and what I try to teach is A, that I find myself using all different tools. I mean, generally just sort of attuned, supportive, interdirective, you know, just makes kind of intuitive sense. Um, you know, absolute kind of radical presence and witnessing and, you know, during, but you know, the whole arc of the process, I, I really feel like draws upon all the therapeutic tools that and, and theoretical orientations that I've ever learned about. Attachment stuff, positive psychology, psychoanalytic, psychodynamic, existential, transpersonal, like, you know, even CBT, like they're just, uh, there are moments and, and particularly when holding the relationship and you were talking about the relationship, Lauren, you know, really getting that commitment from people and actually getting the commitment from me and that like, if we're gonna open up this process that we're gonna commit to it, not everybody's gonna follow through because you might lose to follow up or they might for whatever reason not continue, but if they're gonna continue that you're gonna be in it with them. And that, that's a commitment and it's a, you know, it's, um, I, I feel like the way I've been describing it to people as I've been interviewing people for my practice is kind of like, well, it's kind of advanced. You have to draw upon all these different things that you know, and also your common sense and your intuition and, and your strength to kind of be able to hold the enactments and the parts and the different things that come up, especially when you're dealing with trauma. Um, it's hard work and it, but it's, but when, but I think that when it, when it happens and it happens so organically and it and and you see all these different pieces coming together, I mean, it's so beautiful. Um, and so I see it as a real, you know, I see that like the therapy part as being really like the convergence of, of all different kinds of therapy. Um, and, you know, you, you said relational. I mean, I think that's really key because the things that will happen within the, you know, there's, there's what, the patient's experiences and then their own unfolding. And then there's what happens within the relationship, which can be really accelerated by the medicine. And um, I think that, you know, therapists who aren't trained in psychedelics, you know, that might take them by surprise, like the attachment dynamics and, and it's like an enzyme that will go much quicker. So I think um, having an understanding of as many kinds of therapy as possible and having that experience, I think is really helpful. So, and, and somatic stuff, obviously, I think that's been, um, I, I should mention that because it's, I, I feel like being able to work somatically is so important. Um, all of them are important, but it's, it's something I feel like that ha hasn't been integrated fully into, you know, therapy training so far, but it's so useful, even with ketamine that's supposed to be a dissociative. I mean, that we have to kind of redo that term because like I said, depending on what route of administration or the dose range, you can get really somatic experiences. And how do you work through those non-ordinary states of consciousness if you don't know how to work with that? So really important. Yeah, and I, uh, I agree with all that also. It is so true, right? Like we are all, but this is the point of this, of coming together and sharing this work is that we're all contributing to the whole which is so exciting. Um, and as therapists, you know, we were all drawn to this kind of, of work, to this kind of therapy. And as um, a therapist who's worked primarily with pregnant women and mothers for most of my career, you know, there's all the, the pieces. There's the trauma piece. You know, a lot of women have birth trauma or there's trauma getting pregnant. And it's been so exciting to me to be able to have ketamine be, as Lauren said, one of the tools in the toolbox. Um, and I, I just will share really briefly about a woman that I've been working with for several months um, who I worked with five years ago. And she actually, I worked with her after the birth of her children. And she reached out to me when she learned that I was offering ketamine and she asked if she could work with me again in because she was really wanting to try the ketamine. And I, I really agree with everything that's been said. It is so much of the, the therapeutic relationship that helps to set the safe set and setting, right? That she could come to the setting of a, of a new clinic and feel safe and at home, not just with me, but you know, seeing Julaine in the clinic and having a nice conversation with her, feeling held in the space, but also being held by our relationship. And she could go, you know, this is a woman with severe treatment resistant depression and a lot of self-harm behavior and 
the ketamine has, has been phenomenal for her. And she has so much gratitude during her sessions. And she said to me, you know, to the point about what Lauren has said and others have said about the process of remembering that the ketamine work helps us remember our intrinsic nature, which I think, you know, other plant medicines and psychedelics do as well, but ketamine is especially good at. It's helped her remember who she really is. And part of that, you know, to Sunny's earlier question is her ancestors showing up in the sessions. Her, there's her grandmother, there's her grandfather, there's a grandmother that she hasn't thought about in a long time. There are her children, you know, and it's all, yeah, it's, it's an incredible space that can be amplified by, you know, the attachment relationship or the psychodynamic properties or the dream work, you know, the visionary work. So it's a, it's a really juicy, rich space. And I, I imagine that's what a lot of us share in common with our appeal to work in this way, to work with these medicines. Yeah, I think in, in terms of, I mean, the relationship, one of the things that I've noticed in the relationship is how quickly that alliance is built, as opposed to another client who is not going to be doing medicine, that it takes longer to that relationship to be built. So the relationship starts even before they take ketamine. And, um, and that's amazing to me that it's that you're already building that relationship and they still, they haven't taken it yet. So it's already in the room. It's already bringing that energy. It's already uh, allowing for the space to have that connection. And um, I have a, a, a quick story. Uh, I worked with um, a young woman. It was the youngest person that I had worked with and she came into the space and she was really nervous and she was with her mother. And one of the things that, one of the first things that she said when she, she kind of laid down on the couch and she said, do you live here? And I just thought it was so amazing. It was such a compliment for her to feel that that was my living room <laughs> and that I had created this space where she felt like this feels so nice and so comfortable and and that she thought I had I lived there and so it's just the beginning of that of how, what we bring into the room and how we how we come into the space it's just a very different way than when we're not have the intention of using of using medicine I love that story, Marcella. Um, that's wonderful. And, uh, you know, what it uh, teaches everyone, you know, our audience is the importance of, of setting. Um, and, you know, and setting isn't just about what you, uh, how you make up your office and your space, although that is actually really, really important, but it's also uh, what you bring with yourself into the space. And of course, Everyone is going to, um, everyone knows that relationship, everything stems from relationship, but we all do practices somewhat differently. And um, some people work with, uh, some people on this panel will work with clients that are established and they know, um, and that's beautiful to be able to do that. And some of us, like at our clinic, people come to us for ketamine assisted psychotherapy and they may have already have therapists, but they're coming for this particular work. And so, you know, we, we myself, uh, Melissa, who also works with us, we, we have a way uh, that we've learned. We know that we know safety and relationship is so important. And like Marcella just described, one can start that. Um, you, can, you can develop relationship and safety and the nest and you can do it in that first hour of you can do it in an intake session where it begins and then they come back um and it's to me it's somewhat magical and amazing the way how how quickly that can happen the person is receptive and you are a safe object and they're they are vulnerable because they're going to receive a medicine uh they're going to be um, they're vulnerable because they're going to be letting go and they're going to be in a non-ordinary state. And so they're, they're allowing trust to, to build between the two and or the three that are, are in the room and, um, you know, honoring that trust that they're, that they're giving and putting out there 
and uh, of course never betraying it and helping them navigate this journey which it is a journey and come back safely um, the relationship becomes uh, so cemented and so real and um, you know we as therapists are so lucky to be able to impact so many people, but also to have real relationship with so many people that come through our doors. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, to to um, and talk a bit about the nest. Everything goes into it: um, music, color, art, um, but our smile and our, um, you know, what we offer is such a big part of it too. Um, Thank you. I think everyone's oh, spoken so much. Could I say a few words? I'm sorry, Sunny. Yeah. No, everyone's spoken fine. so much that I feel like they've pretty, pretty much covered everything. The only two things I think I'd like to emphasize, which have probably already have been said, was I really appreciate the character access and um, study that's possible, that one can really have a chance to study the sort of character sculpture that they are and how they can release from some of the fear-based defenses that we all inhabit into a field of safety. And I think it's such a gift to experience oneself, you know, on different levels of just safety. It can be characterological. It's sometimes it's even nervous system level of release, which hasn't ever been present for an individual their whole life. It really is like rewiring your nervous system and then really having a chance to experience what it is to feel safe and all the energy in the mind and in the body that is, that is you know, bound up in positions and defensive structures um, for fear-based kind of protection systems to have that all released. It's such a beautiful experience. And then the emergence phenomena that occurs downstream is what I appreciate the most. When, when someone can actually release from that, all that energy tends to be expressed in creativity and in love. And that to me is the most exquisite aspect of working with ketamine is to really support someone's emergence and for them to be, you know, and to discover together what that is going to look like. And I say discover together because this gets back into the relational piece. I think it really gets into some of these early foundational corrections that's possible in that intimate relationship of being seen, being mirrored, being received, um, being held in the corrective experience because of, as Jelaine was saying, the regression that is present in this um, diet. It's such a beautiful experience. It really does feel like a, a birth, rebirth, reclaiming experience and quite spiritual in that way. It's really an honor and a privilege to do this work. Thank you, Gita. We have about 15 minutes left and I wanna give everyone a chance to say a few words about what you want to communicate to the viewers about ketamine. What's important to you to communicate about ketamine to the people watching? I would like to take your question and and follow on everything that has just been said about uh, the nature of, of our practices and the importance of creating a kind of a holistic, a holistic environment which ketamine can be a part of. And um, the beauty of ketamine, and I think to maximize the potential, the emergence, as Gita was saying, that can happen and the creative um, liberation that can happen um, in, in the course of treatment in ketamine is to to really create that safety, that presence, and then when it is time to introduce um, this agent, um, which is, as we've said, so said so so um, so different for each individual and for each um, experience, really, and and the kind of inner healing intelligence of the medicine um, when properly um, fostered and and kind of doulaed. Um, into um, the person's um, experience. Um, I think that is what's, um, what is the potential with ketamine and uh, what makes it um, such a real joy to, to work with and to see people's um, trans transformation, you know, in the safety of good care. I could just uh, follow a, a bit just on your, your your last uh, word there, Monica, um, you know, the transformation that people go through. And so for our audience watching, um, most of the audience may, may not have had ketamine or they may have, they may know it, you know, that people use it on the street or as a 
occupational drug, it has, you know, it has a reputation that way that is not what we want. So I really want, you know, I, I think we've educated people really well today. Um, but why would you come and use ketamine? Uh, you would use it um, if, with treatment resistant depression, meaning that people have, or people you love or know have struggled with depression and have medicines that they have tried have not worked or they work for a while and they stop working or there are side effects that just aren't, um, aren't sustainable. Uh, people with, uh, with anxiety that is debilitating, they uh, feel it in their body. It keeps them from going out. It keeps, uh, the social anxiety keeps them from moving forward in life. And also to be able to, and we use it for many other reasons, but also you don't have to be you know, that's stuck with emotional or mental illness uh, for, to use ketamine. There's also people coming in and they're wonderful to work with people who are just stuck. They're at a phase of life where things aren't working. They don't understand themselves. They want to feel themselves in a different way. Um, they want to know themselves in a deeper way. Um, and then they may be having relationship or work issues, career. Um, and when people like that come in, um, to do this work, it, it can be amazing, and um, just the the stuck become unstuck. Um, the the last thing I want to just say for the uh, people watching this is, and I know we were going to talk about it, but you know, there's also uh, IV ketamine, and so why come and work with people like us, um, where we work with uh, intramuscular and lozenges, um, and there's a lot of I, you know, IV practitioners out there. And I just want to say that some people benefit from uh, having ketamine that way, but um, I, and I'm sure many, most of you have had so many people come in and say, I, I had IV ketamine and I was left in a room by myself. I had nobody to talk to. Um, there was no therapy involved. It was just the medicine being delivered. And we get those people and, um, so if you're thinking about having a ketamine treatment, do your research and make sure that your provider is somebody who's, who will combine psychotherapy with, uh, with ketamine. So I just wanted to, to make sure that I said that. And um, you know, the other thing is just is the street use um, that, that it's, um, you know, that it's out there and that we do everything we can to, uh, you know, people don't become addicted to ketamine on our watch. We have a way of prescribing, a way of monitoring, a way of using it. And we have actually never had that problem in the years that we've been working with it, that people want it too much or bec become addicted because that is a fear of people out there that if they use ketamine, they may become dependent or addicted to it. Yeah, so Monica and Julaine mentioned some of the things I, I was thinking about. And, um, you know, the, the ketamine can be used as a medication, uh, but that there can be a lot lost or there are some potential risks that can happen. And so when I think about it as using it as a medicine, and, you know, it ha it, we get the medication benefit, the neurobiochemical benefit of the medicine but as well there is the psychological benefit <clears throat> and the transpersonal and so when with this medicine we enter into the transpersonal field it is allowing uh, in the right set and setting for the inner healing intelligence to emerge and that inner healing intelligence then can be the guide in the healing process and so the safe set and setting that you when Lauren talked about the safety and the <clears throat> comfort that allows for that to happen so that it's it's a really important to find a place to work with it where you feel safe and that there is uh, right preparation and integration and that we think about it the both preparation integration on you know the personal level as well as the somatic level in terms of the body the spirit uh, in the family and community and our relationship to the environment. And so that there are all these aspects of our being that we can engage in the process of healing with this medicine. Um, so it's coming with this uh, uh, 
careful preparation and consideration, but uh, there are beautiful benefits and possibilities of healing and transformation with this medicine. This is obviously beyond all of us because we've been, we wouldn't be on this panel if we all didn't sort of embody this, but uh, you know, I, whenever I speak with even kind of seasoned practitioners um, or people in the psychedelic community, there's, um, I feel like there's this bias against ketamine in some instances in which it's viewed as well, this was a legal tool that, you know, once we have the good tools, I think Julaine mentioned it, you know, some of the psychedelics are kind of perceived as more as sexier or that work better, or, you know, those are the ones we're waiting for. Um, and I, and I, I'm assuming that most of you guys would agree that it is the tool in the toolbox that's kind of here to stay and it has its own unique purpose. And that even when all of the psychedelics are uh, legalized, you know, ketamine is still going to be there. It's not like the one that we're kind of, you know, it's not like the bastard stepchild psychedelic, um, you know, that's just sort of bridging us. And I think that I just, you know, I, I see even, you know, new practitioners and even senior people kind of talk about that. And I have my theories as why, but if I, if I want, if the question was, what do I want? One thing I want people to know about ketamine is that it is, um, it's an important tool in the toolbox and it's not just, um, you know, the thing that we're using now because it's legal. So. I'd like to also just remind the, any listener or viewer that if this is something that's calling to you, that there are really beautiful heart headed people doing the work, uh, like all of us and to trust yourself and to be in the space of asking questions around as you like find the right person to work with. I, I've had a number of clients come to me who work with other uh, psychiatrists and doctors who have no personal experience or understanding of how this works and are just giving the medicine. And it's in, as we've already discussed, it can be very disorienting when it's done that way. And so just, be as mindful as you would be getting a, like a brain surgery. This is, this is spiritual surgery that we, that we get to do in this work. And it's deeply, deeply privileged. And, you know, I, I mentioned earlier my conversion story. And one of my greatest accomplishments in life is converting my father in his 70s to ketamine as a man who didn't completely miss the 60s. And he's now my primary physician. He's my primary prescribing medical doctor. He loves ketamine. And, you know, he came from the camp of like all drugs are bad. And, you know, be in the space of educating yourself and your loved ones and know that ketamine is, is a really, really noetic and mystical and profound medicine. It has deep spiritual properties. I think someone mentioned that it's been likened to ayahuasca. I've, I've had a client that say it's way deeper than that. And, you know, there's no interest in like comparing, but, but as we've said, like ketamine has its place and space in the family of things. It's here to stay. And I love how Veronica, you said it's kind of has a, a again, a, a more open, clear palette energetically. So there, there's a lot of room for us to, to create together in a good way. And I think the world needs that. And there's so much uh, that's been said um, already that I support and echo. And I'll just add that um, ketamine, in addition to being a beautiful tool on its own right, if you're a person who has had many psychedelic experiences with other medicines that are less accessible for you, um, that to be in the guided ketamine space is a wonderful tool of uh, integration for other psychedelic experiences as well. So um, that's something else to keep in mind. It's, as Julaine said earlier, and so many of you said, it's a safe, very safe medicine to use, particularly um, in the guided space and, and very powerful. Um, and I, yeah, I, I think it's going to reach a lot of people and I'm, I'm very pleased about that. And, and particularly pleased to um, support the, introduction of this of this particular medicine of ketamine into women's health more fully into the postpartum space um, 
you know, that's so dear to me. Thank you so much for um, asking that question, Sunny. It's a good one. Um, I think so much has been said about ketamine, but I just wanted to emphasize, perhaps even say what people have already said about how ketamine-assisted psychotherapy is really a novel psychotherapeutic approach towards healing that really allows for a very deep process, deep healing, and a movement towards wholeness, and to emphasize how valuable it is for trauma. And so a lot of individuals who've suffered from traumatic experience and suffer with symptoms of trauma, this can be when used very carefully in the right container, the right relationship can just be an extraordinary treatment to release from those kind of painful experiences that we all get stuck in. Um, I definitely echo everything that's been said. And I also want to caution, I think there's ketamine has gotten so popular, so many people doing it. Um, and, you know, there's a saying that, that happens that is said a lot in harm reduction around, there is no such thing as a bad trip. There's only a challenging or a difficult trip, but there is such a thing as a bad trip if there is no set and setting and safety for the person having it. And so, you know, many of you have said he, ketamine is, uh, stands in its own right, but it's not seen that way a lot of times. And it's not a placeholder waiting for other medicines to become legal. Definitely not a placeholder. And it can be seen as they say, it's fast. We can do it fast. We don't have to do too much preparation. We don't have to do too much. And so I caution that even though it is shorter lived, it is by no means less than, and therefore needs to be really taken um, uh, sacredly, it needs to be held in a sacred space, in its own sacred space. And um, so that's what I wanted to add. Wow, thank you. I feel like we've scratched the surface of ketamine. There's so much to talk about together. and. Um, you know, real, what I'm really taking away from this is just the depth and the richness of ketamine assisted psychotherapy. And, you know, given this, this panel within the feminine context, I so appreciate all of you for being here. And again, there were many women that could have been in the panel that deserve to be in the panel that were not able to be in the panel. And so a shout out to all of our, our female uh, colleagues out there and um, great conversation. Um, I will add the, the, the credits for everyone's uh, websites and how to contact you, but um, thank you so much. Brilliant, brilliant humans. I was so honored to be in the circle with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.